Welcome everyone to another edition of Pick Brian's Brain. Okay, now since our last meeting, notice I'm not holding a mic. Therefore, if you can't hear me, immediately send in your comments, let us know. But if this does work, this is going to really enhance picking my brain. Because I love to have my brain picked when I can stand up, move, show you things versus seated like I'm some sort of announcer with a microphone. This ought to be really cool. And if it does work, give a big shout out to my wife, Kira, because for the last two weeks, she has aged two years in trying to figure this whole thing out. All right, well, once again, welcome back. I can't wait to get started. During picking my brain, I require participation. And if you have not sent in your questions already, I ask you to do so while we're running this little event. Okay, Our, we did have some people who have already pre-participated. So let me get right to those right off the bat. The first question that was sent to us was from Laverne. Laverne, thank you very much for sending this question in. She asked, how can you stop your dog from going pee when someone comes into the house because of excitement? She reports that her dog's in good health and they'll be two years old in November. Well, first of all, Laverne, I personally can empathize with you. At one time, I owned a Rottweiler, big Rottweiler, about 95 pounds. And he did this when I came home or anyone came over. And he did this until he was nearly two years old. As you can imagine, it wasn't just a little pee. It was a lot of pee. So therefore, two situations arise out of this. One I learned, hmm, what could I do when I came home versus when I have company? The first way that I dealt with this was choosing who, who comes home the most, me or my company. I'm just going to be honest with you. It's me. When I came home, I would blow past my dog. I know he was excited to see me, but that excitement is what caused him to urinate when I arrived at home. I knew this. Therefore, I went past him like he was a ghost. I kid you not. I would come in the door, there he is, <laughs> being all excited, happy to see dear old Brian. But Brian went right past him like he wasn't even there. I would go into the counter in the kitchen, pull out my wallet, put down my car keys, unsling my backpack, and I would go about business for about two minutes. And then afterwards, I'd go, hey dude, how was your day? And by then, the excitement had come down enough to where he no longer urinated, and it went away on its own over a period of time. But let me explain why this is going on. We humans and dogs all have emotional states. And to not get too deep into it, but to explain, we have three basic emotional states. The first one is our calm zone. And this is where we are nice and calm. The next one happens to be the arousal zone. Arousal. What do you mean by being aroused? It has many levels of being aroused. One is I'm excited, just like my big old Rottweiler was, probably like your dog is. Another one is I'm getting a little nervous here. I'm getting, becoming a little anxious. I'm becoming a little fearful. Have you ever heard someone say, wow, that scared me so bad I peed my pants? Or hear them say, I laughed so hard I peed my pants. Or I was so nervous before I had to get up in front of class and give a speech, I thought for sure I was going to pee my pants. The further we come up, from the calm zone, the further we rise into that arousal zone, and right before we get to what's called the reactive zone, or typically the red zone, when we get to about right here, there is a biological reaction. Hence why we start to sweat. Our palms become sweaty. 
We're nervous. We stutter. We become forgetful. What was I talking about? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. All these things occur. There's a biological reaction. And part of that can also be my inability to hold in my bodily weight, especially when it comes to urine. If my bladder's full, I can become so excited, so nervous, so fearful, so anxious, that I just pee. It happens. It happens to humans and it happens to dogs. That's why it's occurring. It's a biological reaction. Now, of course, you always want to go to your veterinarian and rule out, okay, do I have a UTI? Do I have any sort of incontinence? Rule all this out. But two-year-old dogs typically don't have incontinence, but they may have a UTI. But this doesn't sound like that on the surface. It sounds like we have more of a problem in which the dog's arousal zone is going to a very high level. So to keep that in check, one, when you come home yourself, I know you may be excited to see your dog, but then just go by your dog. Ignore your dog. Don't even look at your dog. Put yourself away, relax for a moment, and during that time, your dog's level will drop down, 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 and when it gets back here in that calm zone, we won't have a problem. Now, what about when company comes over and we have guests? This typically arises with dogs that live in households in which there are not a lot of guests. I've had clients who worked out of their home. One in particular was an accountant. And during the months of January to April, oh man, he probably had 75 people a day walking in his home. No problem with this dog urinating, you can guarantee that. But for the most part, what I want to do when I have my own particular dog and I have this problem, is to do all that I can to keep my dog from rising above this level here. And when strangers come in, they come in as a mixed bag for a lot of dogs. Some come in tall. In wintertime, they're wearing big coats, beanies, hoods. Some come in small, petite, sweet, loving your dog. Others don't. All depend upon what's coming in that door can cause your dog to go higher up this emotional ladder or remain checked at a certain level. But me, I know that is up to my dog. It's not up to me. I've invited countless people to my home that I thought were really nice people. But my dogs didn't see it that way. So therefore, interpretation of what's walking in that door is individual, not up to me. And I'm going to take measures to ensure that I help this whole situation. And one of the things that helps it the most is distance. Around every dog and every human are two magical circles or zones. One is called a threat zone. The other one is the critical zone. The closer this thing is that walked in your door, the closer it gets to the critical zone, the higher up the emotional ladder the animal will travel. That is guaranteed. The critical zone requires action. Now, if this thing walking in was interpreted as a threat, the dog will then choose either fight or flight. If it's not a threat, well, this is guaranteed to send the dog up to here, in which now we could have the problem with the dog urinating. So let me kind of do a little role playing here. I'm going to borrow Joshua, who's one of our professional trainers, and he's going to use his dog Vesper. I'm going to go behind a door over here, and I'm going to knock on the door. And I want you to watch how Joshua treats his guest, me, because this is a perfect example of how you should do this. Okay, here we go. I'm going to go behind the door. And if you can still hear me, I'm going to now knock. Hey, Brian. Hey, man. Good seeing you, brother. Good seeing you. Good seeing you. Can I get you anything? Oh, oh, you know you can. Who's that? This is Vesper. Wow. 
I like your dog. That's a nice dog you have over there. Indeed. Well, good. Well, how you been? Pretty good. Pretty good. Oh, I've been well. It's been hot. Yeah. I I'm hate when it's hot. Hence, fall season. why I love the Alaska. But guys, one thing that you will see here is that Vesper is at a distance. It's okay to go to your door with your dog, but when you have a problem such as what you have, Laverne, after I've identified whether that would be a friend or a foe, I would then take my dog and teach it a new behavior, and this is one that we call place. Place is where the dog is trained to go to a place. In this instance, Vesper was trained to go to a cot, and now the dog will lie on the cot until he gives it a cue to leave the cot. This will do two things for us. One, keep me on my worst day or her worst day in the threat zone. I'm nowhere near this dog's critical zone, which again requires action. Also, by my able, being able to come in and have a seat, I just lowered my six foot two frame down to about a three foot eight to four foot level, which then from a visual aspect lowers my threat profile, allowing Vesper to calm down. And if you can see her way over there, she's about to fall asleep. Distance is your tool, Laverne. Use distance. Train a great stay or train a behavior called place. And this, when, when your dog comes down to the green zone, the calm zone, that's when you can allow her to get up, and that is when you can then have people pet her, and this problem will go away. And if it doesn't, you try this, and you do this for about a month, and we still have this problem, you reach out to me, because we actually have something much deeper going on. But going by what you send me, that's what we do. All right, I'm going to say a big thank you to Joshua. And by the way, you guys are probably looking going, do you ha if you're a male trainer at Tame the Wild, do you have to have long hair? Of course you do. And do you have to have a beard? Of course you do. That's just what we do here. So if you guys ever feel like coming to work for us, whether you be a female or a male, first of all, you got to have the long hair. If you're a guy... You got to grow a beard. And he's got a nice, lot nicer one than I do. All right. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you. All right, Laverne, I sure hope that helps you with your question. Let's move on to another one. While we were waiting for this next event to take place, and while you're waiting for me to put on my glasses, we had Kaylin write us a few questions. First of all, Kaylin, congratulations on the newborn child. That's always a major event in life. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. But sometimes it can be problematic when you own a dog. Kaylin reports that she has a German Shepherd. They say he is six, but still excitable. <laughs> hey, <laughs> just, just so you know, in dog's years, I am much older than six, and I'm still extremely excitable. And I hope I make you get excited about getting this answer here. One thing I want you to understand about having children. I write about this in my book, The Hammer, Why Dogs Attack Us and How to Prevent It. Children are not seen by dogs as the young, innocent beings that we see them as. They're different. Again, your dog has never been a human, never will be a human, and therefore don't count on it to respond like you would. Never count on that. All perception is individual. So now that I've prefaced her question with that, let me finish reading the questions. She says, any suggestions, she asks, for when our baby starts moving around, crawling, walking, etc.? Right now, he, meaning her dog, is doing really well laying down when our baby is on the floor. Awesome. He will come and give him K. 
kisses. Bad. I'll explain that in a second. Or just lay down close by. We are trying to catch our dog being calm and easy around the baby. That behavior is something that you want to nurture. But let me give you a little bit of caution here real quick. Think of a pendulum. When babies first come home, the pendulum is at a severe angle. This is a dangerous time. There are over 1,100 infant fatalities reported just in North America alone every single year. Not to mention what's reported in third world countries. The reason why this occurs is because of the misidentification made by the dog with the baby. Now think about it. You bring home the small child. It's clothed in blankets. Little outfits that don't even have legs in them yet. Or even arm holes. Sounds funny. Smells terrible. <laughs> the dogs, we can only surmise, can't identify with this. Maybe it's just a small creature that needs to be taken out. Maybe it's something that should be killed. Maybe even eaten. I know it's a frightening thing, but it is a reality. And a lot of that plays into it is the age of the animal, what kind of breed it is, and what is it inside? Is it a big, strong animal, or is it a fearful animal? But the first problem is I cannot identify with the baby. And therefore, you run the risk that the dog may make its own assumption of what that thing is. Then during this time period here, when the child first comes home, we have added stress. Dogs thrive on the familiar. Oh my gosh, the familiar to such a point, I would gouge my eyeballs out with a fork if I had to be that familiar. Meaning, they would love to go on the same walk at the same time, in the same location, every day, and then come home and eat the same food in the same kitchen, out of the same bowl, every day. And they get excited or worried when you don't come home when you're supposed to come home. They thrive on the familiar. And we do as well as humans. Now guess what? Here comes new baby. There's nothing familiar about that if this is your first child. And if it's the first child to your dog, there's nothing familiar about that. Now all of a sudden, mama and dad are up at 2 a.m. They're never up at 2 a.m. They're stressed. The dog becomes stressed. There's humans up at all hours of the night. There's something screaming. And it smells horrible. This is something that can really cause animals to act out in ways that we would never assume that they would. Now, fast forward. Here comes that pendulum. Dangerous time when the, when the child first comes home. Now the pendulum swings fully to this other side. And now this is when little Junior, or little Missy, starts to crawl. Oh my. That's when we little humans take on the perception by a dog of being a cub or being a pup, a dog pup. Now maternal instinct, guarding instinct kicks into high gear. Life for a wolf requires four things. Water, food, a mate, and a safe dwelling place to raise my offspring offspring. Look at all of us how protective we are of our offspring. Your dog now chips in. I am a social predator. That young child crawling across the floor is to be protected. So the dog in one instance wants to kill the darn thing. Now all of a sudden six months later wants to kill anyone that tries to touch it big pendulum swing and then the next thing that occurs is a few more months goes by and that young crawling child now stands upright and we're back to possible danger so I'm going to just move the pendulum here to the middle 
in my book, The Hammer, as I write, 50% of the fatalities, the dog attack fatalities that occur in this country, occur to children under the age of nine, with the vast majority of those under the age of two. And the scary part is, 50% of those are by the household pet, a pet that is familiar with the family. So pay heed to this. Once a child is standing upright, the pendulum moves to here because a condition known as the principle of resemblance kicks in, in which the young child is now suddenly, in one day, head level with your six-year-old German Shepherd, if not taller. And from that moment, from that visual reference point, your child is no longer this cub. This child is now a possible opponent, a competitor, or threat. Welcome to being a dog. Most wolves leave their pack right about the age of two, either willingly, because nature turns on all sorts of buttons to help them want to leave, or she has mom or dad, depending on if it's a male wolf or a female, mom and dad will help them to leave. Because every single position in that hierarchy is aggressively defended. Every one of them. And all of a sudden, one day, big old dad, looking across the way, he goes, hey honey, you seen Junior over there? That boy's got a little size on him. I think it's time for him to go. And fortunately, nature turns on many buttons to include sexual awareness and a few others, and Junior wants to leave. So therefore, there's not a big fight between Dad and Junior. But this is one of the problems that we have. We have children who are standing upright, who are approaching the dog, wide-eyed, hands out, grabbing things off the floor, advancing rapidly toward your dog. And the dog warns, no. <clears throat> Growl. It's a hard stare. Taunt body. But unfortunately, little Junior, little Missy, they never see those signals. Even if they do, they don't know what they are. I do. I see that. I'm backing away. They don't. And here they come. So there's a couple of stages there that we need to be aware of. Again, this doesn't mean we rehome our dog. It just means we're aware of it. Knowledge is power. Have this knowledge. Be aware of it. You write in here, Kaylin, that you never allow the dog to be around your young child right now unsupervised. Good for you. Good for you. Don't allow that kind of trust just yet. Let's get this child a little older. All right, Caitlin has another question. Some multi-part questions here. She reports that her dog has shown some food aggression with dogs in the past, but not with humans yet. Remember, maybe not with humans. I don't know the whole story here. But again, I walk in the direction of your dog while it's eating. Your dog looks out the corner of its eye at me. Ears go back. Maybe shows those lips. I'm walking away. I'm gone. And I'm really smart about that because if he, if he really wants that food that bad, it's going to be gone in 10 or 15 seconds anyway. So I'll just go pet the dog later. But again, don't count on your children knowing this. And then the next thing after that comes anything that resembles food. Whether it be a rawhide, whether it be an antler, whether it be a Kong that used to have peanut butter in it, it doesn't matter. Now all of a sudden, we enter into a land called competitive aggression. I'll just leave it right there, calm. Competitive aggression. Be very careful about this. Make sure that you always watch your dog and make sure that your child never approaches your dog when your dog has in its possession anything that it places a high value on. Watch out. That would be a great time 
to teach your child place. No, I'm just kidding. Well, you can, but I would definitely teach that dog place. Dog is over here on a cot. Child is playing over here. Now I have a distance between my child and the dog. Okay, if I had not interviewed people who had buried their children, I probably wouldn't spend this much time on this question. But I have. It's real, guys. Don't treat it lightly. You're dealing with a social predator with big fangs. Don't ever completely trust this around your child. Wait till they grow older. Last question she asked. When her dog stays with us, it does very well. She reports that it plays well with other dogs, sleeps with other dogs. We do pack boarding here in which dogs are allowed to sleep with other dogs because that's what wolves do. They snuggle up. However, she's worried about her siblings coming over with their dogs. She's worried about what's going to happen when they come to her house. And you should be. Because one of the reasons why we have success here with so many dogs being together at any given time is because number one, it's not their house. It's my house. They don't own it. I own it. It's not their territory. It's mine. Number two, we don't have competitive things for them to fight over. When they sleep together, there's no ball in there. There's not even a bed. There's water. You have each other. And sometimes one dog lays on top of the other one and the dog underneath is the bed. But there's nothing to fight over. I've been doing this for almost four decades. Never had a problem with it. Because I understand canine nature. These are the two of the biggest reasons why you don't have, we don't have an issue here, but you could because your home is your dog's territory. In fact, I describe it in the book as the invincible center. And there is no place on the planet Earth that more vigorously defended in there. And I kind of went over that last time in our last Facebook Live, so I'm not going to spend much time on that. Just know you can have problems at your own home. That's where my bed is, it's where my food is, it's in that kitchen, and that's where I keep my rawhide. And you can definitely have problems with other dogs because of competitive aggression. All right, Kayla, I hope that answers your question. If you have any, if that did not, reach out to me and make sure you send in a question uh, or just ask me and I'll go over with you just a little bit deeper. Okay, now I'm going to move on to my buddy, Paul, Paul Carver. Okay, now let me tell you something a little bit about Paul. First of all, I love him to death and he knows that. Paul's like my bodyguard. He's not as big as I am, but Paul is tenacious. I'm telling you why, if they were to dredge up the Titanic from the bottom of the ocean, they came up in 10 million pieces. Paul is the man that I would hire to put that thing back together. He is really an attention to detail, attention to focus type human being. He's very tenacious. He's done an incredible job training his own dog. Uh, and, be, and besides that, out here in the pet world, you can get a little bit of emotions going. If you've ever been in it, you know what I'm talking about. So many differing methodologies and beliefs and research and so on and so forth. Well, hey, anytime I've ever had an issue, Paul's been my man at my back. Paul, love you, brother. Appreciate it all the time. Okay, Paul writes in real quickly. Brian, what are your thoughts or advice about a relationship that exists between abnormal negative behavior while the dog is home or attention seeking? Now, what Paul is really getting to here is that he has an occurrence here in a situation in which his dog, while he and his wife are gone, get up on a sofa. But as soon as they come home, the dog is off the sofa. And you can literally draw a chalk line around the dog's body where it was. And of course, I guarantee you that Tango, that's the name of this dog, is looking up going, uh, Hey man, I was never on that sofa. I know a lot of you are dealing with that. That's a simple case in which the dog is acting out. Thank goodness they don't have the ability to just act out. They have the ability, though, to learn when is it safe to do a behavior 
And when is it not? Give them credit. These are smart animals. What animal is safe to bite? A rabbit or porcupine? Hmm. Life will teach them really quickly. The rabbit is the better choice. Safe versus dangerous. No doubt if Tango is not supposed to be on the couch, Paul has worked extensively to teach him that the couch is a dangerous place to be when Paul or his wife is home. But unfortunately, Tango must not have been kept in a way that would have prevented him from learning through his own self-discovery that there's conditions in which the couch is not dangerous. Me, if I really wanted the dog to learn this, I would do several things. One, I would make sure that the dog did not have the ability to get on the sofa while I was away. And then when I was home, I would correct the dog for getting on the sofa if that was my desire. By doing that, 100% of the time that the dog attempted to get on the sofa, the results would have been bad for the dog. There would have been a consequence. Then the animal would have learned there's never a safe time to get on that sofa. Never. Another way you can deal with that is to make the sofa the culprit. Make the sofa itself a bad thing to get on. Scat mats work great for that. These are just a little clear rubber strip mats and you can get them in various lengths, sizes. They can be half circle. Scat, S-C-A-T, mat. They are originally designed for cats, because you all know, I own two of them, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. As soon as the Christmas tree goes up, they are the star on top. You know it. A cat can get to places that no one can even think of going. They made these mats to make sure, to help you train the cat not to get on certain pieces of furniture or crawl up a Christmas tree. They're wonderful. You get a little 9 volt battery, you can set it on low, medium, or high, and then when Tango touches that mat, he gets a little bit of a sensation. And you can turn it up as you need to, but now he will learn, hmm, sofa's bad. I, I put my paws on it and something got me. Now if you have a cat, or a dog who's smart, and Tango is, my suggestion, Paul, is put the mat on there for a couple of days, but don't turn it on. Don't think for a second, Tango's not going to go, hmm, what is this rubber thing laying on a sofa? What the heck is that? And if something happens to him when he touches it, he could easily learn when it's on there and when it's not. When it's on there and when it's not. Again, back to safe versus dangerous. So now Paul and his wife would have to remember every single day, as soon as you leave the house, make sure the scat mat is on the sofa. Me, I'm putting it on there for a couple days. Go ahead and climb up there. Get your hair all over it. Get your slob or chew your favorite bone up there. Just knock yourself out, Tango. Go for it, brother. And then I'm turning it on. <laughs> That's mean, isn't it? <laughs> Tell you what, gets it done. Gets it done. Love that. So either way works, whatever approach you want to take. A, make the couch bad, or B, be a good zookeeper when you're away, prevent the animal from doing the behavior, and then when you're home, watch the dog. And every time it gets up, bad. Dog on the ground, good. And that will take care of it, Paul. All right, moving on to our next question, if time permits. We do have some more time. Let me address this question here, and we'll, this will be an action answer. Because again, I love action. Why I've got my leash strapped around my chest like this and my bait pouch here. Just want to get after it. So let's talk about this. Greg writes in, Brian, my dog pulls me blank <laughs> badly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think you can read between the lines there, people. When I walk him, how can I get him to stop? Isn't that something? Did you know from being a companion? So let's just put that answer away. Because that is the number one reason why people get a dog. 
either to be a companion to them or a companion to their other dog. But the number two answer, and it's been like this for as long as I can remember, has, to, has been to be a partner to go with on a run, jog, walk, maybe even to meet people. They're great icebreakers. But all that requires leaving the home and going out about. And there is nothing, and I do mean nothing worse, than hooking up a little leash to a dog and all of a sudden, you're gone. And when you get home, all you want to do is put biofreeze all over your back, all over your elbow, all over your shoulder. And you start second guessing next time whether you want to take that walk or not. I cannot tell you how many clients I've had over the years. And it's heartbreaking. I asked them, why did you get the dog? So I could go for a walk, so I could lose weight. I love being outdoors. Well, do you do that? No. We haven't done that for a year. That's why I'm here. For a year? For a year. Listen to that. So for a year, neither the dog got the pleasure of the walk, nor did the human. It is a problem. I know any of you dog owners know what I'm talking about. You've either gone through it yourself or just by golly, have a seat at a park or somewhere and that dogs frequent and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Dogs will be pulling owners everywhere they go. And you will see one very common big mistake. People pulling back. Yeah, you heard me. Dog does this, so you do this. <laughs> Here's the problem with that. I know that comes natural. But you happen to be a vertical creature. They are a horizontal creature. By physics alone, ask any engineering student. This is, has the ability to pull and maintain center of gravity much better than you. And it uses that advantage to pull you. Did you know that bipeds spend a tremendous amount of energy? Bipeds, that's what we are. Just maintaining our balance. As I've been standing here, you see me shift from foot to foot, walk up forward, go back, we're maintaining balance. And we expend tremendous amount of energy doing that. Burning through calories. How many commercials have you seen? Get the desk in which you stand up to work, not sit down. But see, again, with nature, and our, all, all of our dogs still share that phylogenetic relationship with wolves. They still came from wolves, and now they're moving up forward to present-day dogs. Their architecture is still designed the same way. Yes, we've played into it. Yes, we've built smaller dogs with shorter legs and elongated bodies. But they're still horizontal. And because of that, nature built a horizontal creature so they didn't have to waste calories balancing. And she gave their energy to run north and south. So again, be polite. Be nice out there. I'm going to attempt to draw a dog. All right, snout, pointed ears, body, tail, hind legs, front legs, smile. Okay, the power of your dog, about 60% of it is from the front shoulders forward, 40% taken up the back. When your dog moves, it uses that. It throws its weight into that leash and drives forward. And you go yanking back. This animal is designed to A, not have to balance, to not expend valuable calories trying to do this when I move, but to also, when I get to where I'm going, to have enough power 
to now latch on to, to burst forward in a high rate of speed, to grab that elk that outweighs it by 900 pounds, and then thrust backward like a plane landing on an airstrip and pull it to the ground. Any of you owning medium to large dogs, if you ever play tug of war with them, which is one of my favorite games, regardless of what the internet says, you will feel that power going backwards. And then as they charge into your tug of war toy, feel that power when they strike. So therefore, when you pull back, you're going with their power. It'd be like you trying to pull me over right now. Pull, yeah, good luck. But you know what? You even move 20 degrees to either side of me and I go over with a feather. They're the same way. Their power runs north and south. So therefore, any corrections that we try to give to a dog that is pulling need to go across our body, not with their body. When you do this, you're taking your dog to your own personal mobile gym. That's right. You're building this power. You're building its ability to pull you even greater. Avoid doing this. Go across your body. All right, I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate this. Joshua, can you bring out a dog, please? Here we go. This is a young dog. His name is Winston. And we're going to work with Winston on a little bit of walking. Joshua, if I may, may I have you move those chairs for me real quick? Welcome to live, baby. You get to do all sorts of stuff on live. Move chairs, do everything, look back that way, thinking the dog you're going to use is coming through that door back there, but it's actually coming through the door up here. Hey, baby, I love it. Let's roll with it. Well, welcome to Winston here. Cool looking dude, huh? Love that. Look at that shaggy hair. Yes, yeah, everywhere. He's a neat, young, young, young pup. But we've been teaching him here through a training program that we have to walk next to his owners and they'll pull them. No one likes that. So one of the commands that we use is heel. Heel. Again, I don't care what you say. You can say scuba dog for all I care. I just need you to say it consistently. So my young animal will soon learn that, guess what? When I hear this certain word, that becomes an auditory signal. Auditory. And it means to take up a relative position next to my body. Right here. But in the process of training this, two things will occur. One, when he leaves that position while I'm walking, we will impart a minor correction. Because he's a young dog. He doesn't need a bunch of it. And as soon as he comes back by my leg where I want him to be, I'll give him a reward. And I'm going to give him a little treat to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and prime the carburetor right now. Here you go, Winston dog. All right. Now he likes my treat. Let's get, let's get going here. Heel. So as I move with him, if he starts to get out of position at all, then my correction will be across my body. Across my body at any given moment there. Moving across. Here again. There we go. Across my body. And that didn't take any effort for me to do that. Heel. And when he catches up, I'm going to give him a treat right there by my leg because that's where I want him to be. If he starts to pull me in any sort of way, across my body. And I'll do that again over here where you can probably see a little bit better. So if I'm moving, and at any point, she start to leave that position across my body. That's all it takes. It's amazing how quickly they get it. Just go across your body. Resist the temptation to do this. And one of the ways that I have helped people resist that temptation when they're first learning this is if your dog walks on your left side, put your left hand in your pocket. You can't do that then. You can't. If your dog walks on your right side, put your right hand in your pocket. You can't pull back. You can't do it. So therefore, practice. And if that means just one hand on the leash, put one hand on the leash. That's all you have to do. You don't have to have both hands all the time. 
Now, as far as pulling back goes, I do have a couple little exceptions to that rule. One, heel. When I'm walking the dog, especially a young dog, I need to give notice that we're stopping. And that's the time that I'll pull back just a little bit to let young Winston know that we're coming to a stop. This expectation for my five-month-old dog here, or any dog that's from five months to a year, to look at you the entire time that's walking is not realistic. The whole world to young Winston is Disneyland. That leaf, everything. And therefore, that's where his focus goes. I know that. I'm going to be really realistic about that. Here we go again. One last time. Heel. I'm walk with him. Heel. Very good. And as you see there, I just go across my body. Across my body. And as soon as he lands in that little set, if you want to add that to the end of your walk, you certainly can. Give the dog a reward. And every time it shows up, every time it shows up here by our leg, then give him a reward. Okay, and these are just some fundamentals when it comes to walking. Know this, from a wolf perspective, everywhere they travel, they travel in a single file line. And I, that could take me 30 minutes to explain why. Just know this, from a natural standpoint, your dog doesn't want to be by your side. But for a human perspective, that's what works out the best. Because while I'm training Winston here, Sid, oh boy, now when I shake your hand, he's not in my space. We're on the side of a road, you can, we're not stepping out into the traffic. And lastly, when I want to go through a door, he's not in my way. It doesn't work out for dogs to be out ahead of us. It works better if they're by our side. All right, Greg, I hope that helps you. Pull across your body. Now, if you guys want to follow Winston's training, just simply go to our Instagram page and just go to at, win at winnie.the.what? <laughs> Welcome to live, baby. Here we go. That's Winston's personal Instagram page that his family does. Oh, Winston's personal Instagram page. Aren't you something special? I don't even think I have a personal Instagram page. But anyway, it's at Winnie, W-I-N-N-I-E dot the, T-H-E, dot D-O-O-H. Got it? All right, man, I did not realize I was in the company of such a famous dog. Way to go, Winston. Allow me, sir. Beautiful dog, huh? Wonderful. All right, I'm going to hand Winston back to one of my trainers, and we're going to be on to one more question. We probably have time for just one more. Okay, once again, feed those questions into me. Paul Carver wrote him just a little bit ago and said, Drew Jones, but not sure where you pup is this point. Okay, Paul, to read that, I'd have my glasses on. <laughs> so therefore, Drew Jones, not sure where your pup is at this point, but you may want to tune in to this. Okay, hey, thanks, Paul. Uh, just Paul inviting one of his friends there to tune in. All right, let's go on to one more question here. We have time for just one more. Okay, Lindsay writes in, I can't get my dog to stop going potty in the house. All right, Lindsay, I have a new puppy. I got him a week ago, and he is a 15-week-old Siberian Husky. Yay! I like lots of dogs, but I grew up in Alaska, and that breed is, I'm very fond of that breed. But guess what? You and I share the exact same problem. Dogs weren't meant to be housebroken. They weren't meant to be. You ever seen the houses out there in the wild? Wolf goes wherever it wants to go. This is a human desire, kind of like walking next to me. It's a human desire. If otherwise, the dog would just simply be out front or back there behind Brian. Housebreaking, I do have a book for that. It's called Housebreaking 10 Steps to Success. And these are all accessible on Amazon. Grab that book, goes to a lot of different steps. That if you take those, like I'm doing, you're going to be on your way to a dog that is housebroken in no time.
Now I will cover just a couple points that are in that book for all of those of you out there. Just what I consider to be really, really key points. One, what is housebreaking about? It's about establishing an environment. Remember Tango, Paul Carter's dog? Hopping up on that sofa when he's gone, but then not on the sofa when he's home. Well, how many dogs, through the housebreaking process, learn, oh, it's not dangerous to go in the house. It's just dangerous to go in front of the humans. And next thing you know, they're running off to that formal dining room that you never use, but maybe once or twice a year. And then they go into that formal or that guest bedroom that really never gets used. In other words, what they learn is this. Out of sight of humans, hmm, I can go. And that's exactly what happens. And the reason why that happens is exactly the reason why Paul is dealing with Tango getting on the sofa. Because we have afforded the young animal the ability to learn through its own self-discovery. Learning is accomplished by a dog through, naturally, through exploration. Instinct drives it to do a behavior. It's the motivator behind action. And life does indeed reward action. So they perform an action. And then they get feedback. And the feedback they receive will either reinforce that action occurring again in the future, or it will degrade that action and move it into extinction. In other words, don't do that again. They learn this when you give them the ability to learn this. My number one, I, my wife and I were just talking the other day about our puppy. And I told her, I personally just can't even imagine owning a puppy without the benefit of a long leash. Not the one I just used a minute ago that's four feet. 15 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet. And you know what we've been doing around our home? Tying it to our island in the kitchen. Tying it to us. Tying it to a heavy coffee table we have. Because young Tikani, and that is his name, when he tries to go away from us, he can't. And therefore, on four occasions, he has gone potty in our home but all four times, he was caught. There was no ability, and will be no ability, for Takani to go potty in our home that he is not caught. And when we can't watch him, we must leave the home, shower, do some work, whatever. And I can't watch him then we put him in the other tool that I can't even imagine owning a young dog without. And that is his den. It's a crate, a kennel, call it what you will. And it's just big enough for him to stand up, turn around, lie down comfortably, and that's it. And if he tries to go potty in there, which he hasn't yet, but if he does, he's going to learn through his own self-discovery. He's in it. And once they learn that, they go, I think I'll just give it a moment. <laughs> I think I'll wait till Brian comes and gets me out of here and go outside. So over a period of time, using a long line and a kennel, our young dog is already starting to pick it up. And your dog will too. Because every time they go outside, there's no consequence. It's always great. Every time they go in, every time, it's never good. And by the way, if you're thinking, well, what is never good? At this point, it's just no. <laughs> hey, what the heck? No, no, sir. Uh, excuse me, we're going outside. 
That's all it takes for a young dog. Don't be spanking your dog or hitting it with some rolled up magazine. And worse yet, definitely don't stick its nose in its poop. Oh my gosh, don't even go there. All you have to do at this point here is no, bad dog. Then take the dog outside because the dog just demonstrated to you that it does need to go. If you do that alone, and those are just a couple of steps in that housebreaking book, you'll get it done. Be patient. It doesn't happen in seven days, and I don't care what book came out and what author wrote that. Give me a break. We're humans. How long did it take you to become housebroken? It's going to take your dog a little while. They are slow, maturing mammals. Very slow. So if you can't pick up that book, housebreaking, 10 steps to success, and it will get you where you want to go. I promise. It's only about yay thick, no frills, get after it, 10 steps, get it done. And you and me, we are all going to be so happy and so relieved. Because right now, it is stressful. In fact, have you ever heard of saying it's the painter's house that needs the painting? Oh yeah, I don't get a get out of jail free card because I do this for a living. I have to go home and do exactly what I tell you to do. Exactly. So I'm doing it. I'm having success. You will as well. All right, if time permits, I'm going to roll into one more question. Do we have any comments or anything I need to feedback from my team? By the way, my team's back there behind this camera giving me all these funny faces. And yeah, it's going to be training time when we get done with this, if you know what I mean. Okay, last question. Let's see if we can cover one. Let me go through because we got a bunch of questions. Man, I love you people. I love participation. And I know you're out there. I can see you. Just you think because I can't see because there's just some little camera here. Well, let me tell you something. I can. <whistles> Hear a little whistle? Funny little story. When I was growing up as a kid, we didn't have email. We had regular mail. And every time we went to one of those little blue mailboxes, my father would lower the lid, pull the lid down, stick the mail envelope halfway in, and he'd whistle. Just like that. And suddenly, magically, the letter disappeared. And to my amazement, this happened every single time. And finally, after about the fifth time, my dad turns to me and says, that's the mailman. He lives in there. He lives in that little box. I thought, really? And he goes, yes, and that's why I whistle. Because now he reaches up and he takes the envelope. And that's one of the reasons why I wondered why we kept giving a cookie. Every time the letter went in the mailbox, after it was taken by the little miniature mailman that lived inside, we had to give him a cookie. So any of you back in the day, this was a long time ago, ever got letters that were covered in chocolate or food stains, you can blame my dad. I think the sad part behind that whole story is I was 30-something before I realized it wasn't true. <laughs> anyway, I know you're out there. Make sure you meet email. You don't have to go to the mailbox and whistle and hand the little guy inside the letter. Send us an email and make sure that we get it. All right, I'm going to see if I can answer one quick question real fast here when we get this thing done. Oh, that is way too busy. Here's an easy one. I'm going to go for this one. So though, therefore, if you sent those questions in, I will get to them next time we meet. I promise. Uh, we're speaking of which, let me put that out real quick. We are our next Facebook Live event will be held on October the 17th. That's a Wednesday. A Wednesday. Why? We have a daughter who is a freshman at UPenn, and it's Parents Weekend. So, being good parents, we're going to go visit her. So Wednesday, October the 17th, then we will resume the following week on Thursday, October 25th, and then we're going to hold this event every single week on every Thursday. If you have suggestions on how you'd like to see it change up, or if you'd like a different time or a different date, send it to us. 
But we're only going to get rolling here. Now that I don't have to hold the mic, we're going to be going outdoors. We're going to be doing many things. We have a lot of uh, big ideas for this. But the last question I had, just real quick. Well, giving my dog, and this comes from Scott. Scott asked, well, giving my dog human food cause begging. In short, yes, <laughs> it absolutely will. I don't know if I have a real scientific question, answer for you. Just know this, human food tastes better than dog food. Giving it one time may not cause begging. Giving it multiple times will allow your dog to learn again through its own self-discovery that, hey, you are a vending machine. And if I give you a certain amount of attention, you'll give me the food. Begging does occur. I don't know of any dog that was ever given food from humans consistently did not start to beg. Again, unless they were given curry or something like that, then they may not. All right, guys, I have certainly enjoyed our time. Uh, do we have any time left? We are out of time. That's what I thought. I'm like a dog. I know exactly what time it is, even without looking. Enjoyed it. We'll catch you guys next time. Make sure you email or just call us or any way that you need to. Send us questions, and I'll do my best to answer. All right, same bad time, same bad station. See you then.